one of the most powerful things in medicine is testimonial. But what's even more powerful is that someone who's worked their whole lives in the healthcare industry has gone through these health issues. And not only do they live to talk about it, but they talked about what, how do you solve these things and how do you solve these problems outside of what's done conventionally? So I want to introduce Linda Harris. And Linda Harris wrote this fabulous book, and I suggest everyone read it. And it's called The Fibromyalgia TMJ Connection, How Your Jaw, Teeth, Airway, and Meridians Affect Your Symptoms. Now, this is not something I've, I've really learned before in school. This is not something I even considered uh, thinking about. And I never really connected uh, oral health and dentistry with fibromyalgia and TMJ and chronic pain. But in reality, there's amazing association. And so Linda Faye Harris, uh, she is an RN. And what she is here to do is to let us know what her journey has been and what she has discovered. Let's check out her story. It's a really powerful one. Linda, listen, thank you so much for being on. I'm so happy that you're on with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So let's um, let's start here. Um, let's go into some objectives you would like for the audience to learn today uh, based on our talk. And then we'll get into a background a little bit. Sounds good? Sounds good. Great. Well, a couple of things I would like people to know is uh, for fibromyalgia, maybe um, there's other alternatives. You could go to a dentist, a TMJ dentist to um, find, um, mm. to get treated for fibromyalgia because mm. that's that's how I got treated. I was surprised because I'm a nurse and I'd only gone to doctors, but I found out actually by going to a naturopath and so, and I'd really like people to know that um, for fibromyalgia, there can be a TMJ problem, an airway problem, and a meridian problem. And people can have um, uh, overbite and people, um, people can have um, a high palate and that can affect their airway. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, this is not a concept I learned in, in school uh, at all. Um, it's very, very foreign to me, or it, it was before. But the reason why we've been having this talk is because, um, and even in my practice, we've, we've kind of identified this uh, completely on accident based on data analytics of people with chronic pain. Um, before we dive into the details of that, let's kind of go into your your history, your background. What did you do before? What do you do now? and uh, and your your progression towards you know searching for solutions. Okay, well, I was a head nurse at a hospital and on the Friday of Labor Day, I had one tooth missing, so I had a bridge put on and I started fainting on the Monday of Labor Day, Labor Day being like in, in September. And I fainted 10 times between se September and the middle of October, my temporary bridge popped off and it, the permanent one wasn't going to be ready for two weeks. My fainting stopped those two weeks. Then when the permanent bridge went on, I started fainting again. So I went to the dentist. I said, you know, I think this is the problem's my teeth. Is it the metal? What is it? And he's, I was there on a Sunday and he said, no, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Mm. Following week, I had a severe toothache. I was in the dentist's office again on a Sunday. Mm. And he x-rayed and I had an abscess underneath the new bridge that I put, had put on two weeks before. Oh, wow. Okay. So things happened really fast then for you. Yeah. It did very much so, yeah. but I had a problem with perfume and smell and that's what caused my fainting. It would be, I go into a room that had a lot of perfume and I just pass out. Oh, interesting. And, and it's, and this is, now, you didn't have a problem with perfume and smell before the bridge was put no, on, right? No. Okay. This is all like since that was done and you had the that's sensitivity, right. right? Okay. That's, that's right. So then um, what happened is I had to have a root canal done. And I went to an endodontist that my dentist sent me to. And he really thought that this fainting was anxiety. And he treated me like that in the office. 
I, I, he said, which tooth is it? And he was tapping my teeth and I couldn't tell him which tooth it was. And I put my finger in my mouth to show him. And he said, get your finger out of your mouth. How can I examine you with your finger in your mouth? Mm -hmm. So I walked out of his office and I, my girl, my sister-in-law worked in neuro research at the hospital. I went to the university hospital. She was on a lunch break. So I went to the dental library and this is divine intervention because I was in the wrong stairwell and a dent there was a man in the stairwell and he says, well, what do you want to know? I'm a fourth year dental student. And mm. I says, well, I've got a hole in my bridge. And he said, are you on antibiotics? And I said, no, I asked my dentist. He said, I need to go on them. He says, well, you do. And he sent me down to the dental clinic. They gave me antibiotics and they did my root canal on the Monday. And um, when they were doing the root canal, I thought somebody had spilt bleach. I thought I was going to be sick. And he says, no, no, nobody spilt bleach. It's bleach on the cotton batten that I'm cleaning out your tooth. Okay. So then he realized when he did the root canal that the root of that tooth navigated to the sinuses. So as soon as he did the root canal, I had no more fainting. Mm. But within three months i was diagnosed with fibromyalgia okay no, so i guess this was on your upper palate right yes yeah, it and was then... 213 okay so yeah 213 upper palate and that extended into the maxillary sinus i guess okay that's right so so let me just pause here for a little bit because um what you're describing is uh is it's actually relatively common um and um, and at that time, and, and how long ago was this? How many years ago was this? Linda? This was in 1995. Okay, 1995. Well, at that time, no one knew about this. But now um, there's a lot of studies that's being done. So what you uh, experienced was perhaps an element of what's now known as the trigeminal cardiac reflex. So the trigeminal cardiac reflex is um, you have this nerve that's on the side of your face. It's like, a, it's like my hand. And it spreads. Uh, into five different branches and those branches have other branches so the bottom three branches actually have nerve endings onto the bottom jaw to the top jaw the maxilla and the mandible and they have other branches to the teeth and so what happens is that it's sensing something so for example if your teeth doesn't necessarily align together correctly it's sensing that something's missing the bite's not there so this trigeminal nerve will go back to the trigeminal nucleus in the brain, and that part of the brain will shut off uh, the 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 connections to the thing that uh, that inhibits the uh, uh, the drive for what's called the sympathetic response. So you're so you're stuck in this like go 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 sympathetic response, and that can cause your heart to go slow and even causing heart pauses. So. In 2022, there was, it was one of the first cases documented in humans to actually have that happen where, where the trigeminal response from, a, from one tooth actually caused the heart to temporarily stop, right? right? And so, but at that time, like this is, that was not a, a, a known thing. Um, and even now, this is still not quite uh, as known uh, thing as well, but that's, that's likely uh, what happened. And then of course, when you had the the infection your 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 nerve endings are like ah, okay it's like something's right. wrong we, we got to do something so yeah definitely uh I'm, and i'm glad you made it made it out of that event yeah so am i <laughs> yeah but but continue go ahead yeah okay so i was diagnosed with fibromyalgia back in 95 they thought it was really related to anxiety they didn't really know as much i had the trigger points but you know i had a lot of they thought it was maybe related to stress. Um, so eight months later, I started fainting again. And <clears throat> so instead of going to the doctor, because when I did go to the doctor, my Holter monitor was negative. My neurology was negative. Um, I decided to go to a dentist and ask him to x-ray my teeth. And I had an abscess underneath the root canal that I had done. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So they did another root canal and then the fainting stopped once more. Mm -hmm. But by that time I had 29 symptoms. I had all the symptoms down the meridian of 213. Plus I had TMJ symptoms and airway symptoms. And you couldn't go to a medical doctor, at least in my area with 29 symptoms. 
So I went to a naturopath, a Dr. Robert Dronick in London, and I took this piece of paper with the 29 symptoms and I said, all this started with my teeth. And he says, it is your teeth. He says, your bridge is right here. Without me opening my mouth, he knew exactly where my bridge was. Mm. So he gave me the chart, the meridian chart, and I took it to, I went to a new dentist. I took it to him and I said, I think there's something wrong with my bridge. He looked at me in the chair with my mouth open and said, no, there's nothing wrong with your bridge. So then I went to another dentist and I took the chart again and he looked at me with my mouth open and said, there's nothing wrong with your bridge and no naturopath's going to tell me that the problem's your teeth. I realized now why they couldn't figure it out because nobody looked at my bite and I was in a crossbite and I also had TMJ. Mm, okay. Well, let's, let's, let's back up a little bit. Um, let's get the audience to understand like, what are you talking about when you're saying the meridian or meridian chart? Okay. Um, well, most people know about acupuncture and the fact that it's, it's based on energy channels in your body. Mm -hmm. And um, those acupuncture lines actually go through the teeth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's 12 meridians in your body. So there's different meridians. Um, of those 12 meridians, they go through the teeth. And you can, when I interview people, you can have symptoms down the meridian of the tooth that hits first. So that's kind of what I learned about meridians, I don't know a lot, but what I can say is I know that the energy level is affected down the entire meridian if you're hitting that tooth first or you have a problem with the root canal. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, let me let me let me back you up on this uh, a little bit. Um, and so um, so my mother is an acupuncturist um, and Eastern medicine doctor. And so let me describe meridians um, sort of from a Chinese medicine philosophy and then tie it together with the science and the Western medicine philosophy. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So, um, so the meridians, and they do run through the teeth, the meridians are talked about as energy channels. However, the translation of meridians uh, was done by the French. It's actually incorrect. Um, meridians actually is not, uh, it's not energy. Rather, meridians is uh, is physiologic pathways, and these pathways, although we can describe it as energy, is actually a very European way of looking at it. In reality, um, so in Chinese medicine, there's a physical thing that's linking everything in the body, and we now know that structure is called the fascia. So the right. fascia, yeah, is the components that overlie a lot of the organs, the blood vessels, the um, uh, the teeth, right? uh and and muscles so this fascia has millions and millions of nerve endings within it it senses and it also produces pain and produces discomfort and so this fascia is actually um triggered by the play between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response the fight or flight response and the and the rest and digest response so whenever in chinese medicine we're talking about um meridian points going through teeth and if it goes through like heart, lung, kidney, spleen, thyroid, it's not talking about the actual organs. It's actually talking about what the organ system actually does. So for example, if you have a thyroid meridian, well, this that technically goes all the way to your feet because there's elements about this, this endocrine grant, gland that affects circulation and stuff like that. And so, uh, so in Western medicine, when people look at a meridian chart and seeing all these different organs, uh, they're looking to see in the blood ray, is there anything different in the blood work for these organs? Well, it may not be the actual organs themselves, but that organ is part of it and it's actually further down the line and it's, it's described in systems. And that actually um, started because in Chinese medicine, we look at symptom clusters and how it relates to uh, certain elements of the body. But now we now know it's fascia. And more recently, in the heart, there's a new science, uh, the science of something called the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx are this web structure that forms around your teeth, around your gums, goes down to the vessels, to the heart, that's everywhere in the body. And they form like these little, little webs. And when you map out the highways of the glycocalyx, while well, they kind of resemble the 12 meridians in Chinese medicine. And so now there's uh, this new science behind glycocalyx health that actually describes how these things are actually linked together, not just the teeth, but elements of the body. So it's, it's a really cool thing. It's an emerging field, but 
it's this is where the the east meets west <laughs> philosophy wow. comes. that's yeah. what we need yeah <laughs> yeah great, for sure yeah so okay so now um like you now have learned about this meridian chart right from this natural path and this natural path is able to identify exactly like where where your issues are right yes. and i guess this natural path is eastern medicine right is it chinese medicine or what uh I'm sorry, what did you mean? Oh, so so in naturopathic medicine, there's different different types of naturopathic oh, medicine. I, I, I don't know exactly what he did. All I know is I went to him with these symptoms and, yeah. and he gave me the chart. That's basically what I know about that. Hey, that's all that matters, right? You got the information to be able to help you with right. your health. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, tell, tell us what happened next. Okay, so... For another eight months, I didn't couldn't do anything. And I'd signed up to go on a medical mission to Ecuador. And I'd mm -hmm. signed up the year before. I really wasn't feeling 100%, but I w went anyways. And I changed planes in Miami and a couple got on late. So um, I switched so the couple could sit together. And I sat next to this lady from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And to me, this is divine intervention because we're talking about our daughters playing soccer and yeah. she says, oh, we just about lost our star soccer. She had pain, star soccer player. She had pain in her arm and her leg. But mm. there was a dentist's daughter on the team. And he says, oh, I know what your problem is. Your bite's off. And I said, you know a dentist that knows this? And she says, yes. So mm. she sent me a letter. And it was there when I got home from Ecuador. I went to see Dr. Goal. He was in Michigan. And the first thing he did was give me a mirror and say, do you think your bite looks right? And no, it didn't. I was in a crossbite. You know, the center of my top teeth and the center of my bottom teeth did not line up. I also had TMJ. I could not put my tongue to my bottom lip. And I had scalloping all the way around my tongue. And he put, Dr. Goal looked at my teeth and he says, well, here's the problem here. Your bridge is sitting too close to your cheek. Okay. And so he said he had to take it off. And when he took it off, he said, here's the problem. When he spiked the tooth behind and in front of the tooth I was missing to hold on the bridge, he said it had an angle on it. And so because of the angle, the bridge was sitting too close to my cheek. So that's why I was biting my cheek. That's why I had difficulty swallowing pills. I mean, I had all sorts of symptoms. So he took it off. And as soon as he took it off, every single symptom down that meridian went away instantaneously. Before I couldn't turn my neck. I mean, I had to turn my whole body to turn. And yeah. as soon as he took it off, my entire I could I could turn my head, my shoulders, my whole body relaxed. The entire so body that, relaxed. Was that an instantaneous thing or did it take Instant, a few days? No, instantaneous. Oh, okay. Okay. Like literally, like right when he took it yep. off. You had to yeah, like the, the malocclusion was gone. As soon as the malocclusion was gone. Yeah. I wasn't hitting that tooth and those symptoms went away. Okay. Can, can you, uh, can you tell us what malocclusion means? Okay. The, the teeth aren't hitting evenly or mm. um, there's an incorrect um, bite. And okay. so I was hitting, hitting my one tooth first. And after that, they were all hitting together. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, but your, um, but no, none of this happened before the before the bridge. No, no, not oh. at all. So yeah, you basically like no symptoms before the bridge. You got the bridge. These sequence of events happened seemingly yes. very short amount of time, right? Two and then you years. Got Two years. Well, yeah, it started. The fibromyalgia symptoms started within about four or five months. Okay. Um, or that that it was diagnosed because you can't go with those symptoms. They won't diagnose it until you've had it for three months at that time. Right. Yeah. The diagnostic criteria is uh, it's very specific for uh, for fibromyalgia. So I guess you hit all the criteria, the the tender points in the body, yes. the headaches and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. And so um, so what is the time from when you were diagnosed with fibromyalgia and having those symptoms to discuss, to all the way and now meeting this dentist who who understands this? It was um, a little, it was two years, two years and a month. Okay. And, um, I always had migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. So I obviously, I did have TMJ before that, okay. um, but nobody diagnosed me. Um, but 
after he took the bridge off and my whole body relaxed, um, he said, we can get rid of your migraine headaches um, by bringing your bottom jaw forward. So I said, you can get rid of my headaches. I'd had headaches for 30 years. I mean, I was on Imitrax. I'd been in research studies. I mean, I had headaches probably twice a week. Yeah. So then um, the roads were bad and I ended up going, finding a head, neck and facial pain dentist in London, Ontario. He put a double splint that was a splint of my top teeth and bottom teeth. It interlocked and I could only take it off to brush my teeth. And I wore that for six months and my migraine headaches went away. And then I had to have braces to line up my teeth because now they didn't line up because my bottom jaw was forward. Gotcha. Did that for a year and a half. But after that, I felt healthier than I did when I was 20. I mean, oh. it was like a whole new life for me. It's interesting because um now you so these headaches have been going on for, for 30 years before you had the bridge. Yes, yes. And what it seems like is that your malocclusion or misaligned bite um was a precipitating factor for those 30 years of migraines as well, right? Yep, that's wow. right. Wow. And I mean, you know, here we are and a lot of the Western medicine kind of treating migraines with a lot of medicines and Botox and stuff like that, right? to try to mitigate the the symptoms and sometimes it, it doesn't necessarily work. And so um, the splint that you're talking about, the upper and lower splint, I guess that was designed to get your bite to meet together like evenly, right? Oh, no, no, it wasn't. It was designed to bring my bottom jaw forward. Got it. Okay. So this appliance that, that brings that bottom jaw forward and then yes. you have to get with the donics to, to do that afterwards. Yes. So okay. it brought it, it brought my bottom jaw forward seven millimeters. Wow. Just Ooh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's it did. It brought, you know, they measured it. It was seven millimeters. And um, it was probably at the I had it on for six months, about five months into wearing the splint. It was like there was a pop and my entire jaw came forward. OK, so the only moving joint in your skull is your, is your temporal mandibular joint, the TMJ right here, where your mandible meets into the skull. And so I guess what popped is maybe the TMJ was able to be shifted forward to kind of align properly into that. So did your TMJ symptoms go away after that or improve? Yeah, everything went away. I mean, the itching in the, the, the ear, I'd had floaters in my left eye. I had twitching. I had um, ringing in my ear sometime, but not always. I had a lot of neck pain. I had headaches that um, went over my left eye. And I, I'd be sick. I, I'd vomit. I mean, I was, I was down for probably six or seven, maybe eight hours. But the Imitrex, when I went on Imitrex, that seemed to, I could at least get rid of the headaches with Imitrex after a couple of hours. Now, now being, being a nurse at a, at a hospital, head nurse at a hospital, you, know, you, you think you'd be exposed to this type of knowledge beforehand, right? What was it surprising? It was very surprising. I said, if I don't know, how is anybody else supposed to know? Yeah, yeah. And so um, going back into your other symptoms, the the floaters, the itching in the ear and the nausea and stuff like that. And so uh, what happens and for people just to kind of understand this from an anatomical standpoint is that if our TMJ doesn't sit in our jaw properly and there's um, retraction, basically the jaw's back where there's crossbites, or both a lot of times and uh, restricted airway meaning narrow palate if that doesn't meet together that means our skeleton structure is not optimal and in the human body when the skeleton structure is not optimal the fascia reacts okay so in chinese medicine we call it the chi starts moving different directions right to try to accommodate so and what it means is that the fascia starts trying to constrict and modulate the entire area right and uh, and it it just constricts 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 constricts, and it can constrict different compartments. So one compartment can constrict, and you can have increased histamine in that compartment, which causes imbalance and nausea and ear itching and stuff like that and vertigo. Okay, and when that fascia constricts even more, the contortion of your eyes can be changed, and you can have floaters and different things like that. You can have blurry vision. 
And this is really hard to diagnose because one day you can have really bad constriction and your eye exam by your eye doctor will look really terrible. The next day it will go away. Your TMJ is actually better and like it will look normal. So it's really even hard to diagnose um, even, even modern day times. But the fact that, you know, your jaw click forward and everything, a lot of stuff start going away is just, is just absolutely fascinating. So, so, so tell me the emotion that, at that time, like how, how did you feel when, when that occurred? I felt that I was blessed by God. That's what I felt. That's amazing. It was, it was just the most amazing feeling ever. And I thought I have to help other people. This, if I felt that God got me better for a reason, and that's to go out and help other people. That's amazing. That's, that's what a brilliant story. And, and here you are talking to, to me and we're just dressing this uh, from modern day standpoint. And hopefully everyone listening to this is getting something out of it. So if you're a healthcare professional listening to this, there's a lot to learn there. And if you're a person going through fibromyalgia and chronic pain, or if you're a family member, please share this. Share this really, really important message because this is something that's not necessarily trained uh, within the field of medicine. Actually, actually, not even really within the field of dentistry <laughs> either. And so, uh, okay, now let's let's start let's start uh, going forward a little bit. So now that you kind of experienced this. Um, I assume a lot of things happened between you experiencing that and writing the book that you wrote, right? Yes. So let's talk about what happened in between. Yeah. Hey, there's one other thing I want to mention to you about when my bridge come off. I got yeah. home. I got home and my husband said, I told him everything was I had no pain. And he says, honey, your eyes look different. And I said, what do you mean my eyes look different? And he says, I can see the blue in your eyes now. So that means I was on sympathetic overload. My pupils were gigantic. And yeah. I really, I thought it was because of the pain I was in. Yeah. But once the bridge came off, I was so relaxed. And the other thing that changed is I was having a mammogram done every six months. Yeah. And when the bridge came off, the next time I went to have my mammogram, it was negative. And they couldn't understand it. Well, I come home and looked at my nursing anatomy book and I thought, oh, this is it here, the lymphatic. Once once the muscles were relaxed, my lymphatic could drain, or at least that's how I interpret it. Oh, yeah, that's fascinating. So so let me explain that for a second. Uh, so what happens is um, a lot of your bite dictates the, uh, the strictures around uh, this area right here from the jawline to your clavicle. And as that starts contracting, it brings the entire chest and shoulder up, your clavicle up. And what happens is that your intercostal fascia, the, the fascia between your ribs, they start contracting and it decreases the lymphatic drainage of the area. So on mammograms, it looks like you have like dense breast tissue, right? In reality, everything's just so contracted here. So it's, it's, a, it's a plumbing problem. So there's nowhere for the lymphatics to go. So right. it, it actually uh, engorges. So uh, but yeah, that's that's a fascinating thing that happened. But it, this is uh, this is something that that's exciting for me to talk about because we see this all the time here at Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine. But yeah, yes. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then once once I did get better, I started interviewing people. Yeah. And um, I at that time I just did the TMJ questionnaire and did the meridians. And there was a lady that had been sick for thirty six years. And I went and interviewed her. She went to see Dr. Rondo in London. And she got better. So her letter is in in my book about her getting better. She was like that the day I went to see her, she said that morning she went to church and asked God to take her life or send her an angel to get me better. And she says, you arrived at my door. You're but the angel. <laughs> she, yes, and she's better. So then Correct. I thought, well, then I'm going to start interviewing more people. So yeah. I did, and people are going to get help, and it's just so amazing. And I also went to a lecture by a Dr. Hall from California who's talking about fibromyalgia. Yeah. And after it was over, the conference, I went up to talk to him, and there was a lady in front of me, and there were three people. The one lady said her 16-year-old had been in bed with fibromyalgia for six months. So the next, when she finished, the next lady went up and I said to the lady with the 16 year old, I said, could I, can I ask you something? And she says, sure. I said, did your daughter have any problem with her teeth before she got fibromyalgia? And her eyes got like saucers. And she says, my daughter flew off her bike head first before mm. the fibromyalgia started. Mm. 
So, um, and that's exactly what happened to me when I was seven. I flew off the front of my my bike and you know what? Maybe that's when my jaw started clicking. I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I started interviewing people and I sent so many people to Dr. Rondo. I told them I wanted to take the TMJ course in Texas. So I went and took the TMJ course in Texas. It's a TMJ assistant course. I wanted more knowledge of the jaw when I when I interviewed people. And um, so I'd interviewed either on the phone or even in my house, over 100 people. And so then um, my husband wanted me to write a book. I didn't think I was a writer. I didn't want to do it. And yeah. he told me that I had to. And he he died two years ago. So oh. I decided to take a book writing course and I wrote the book. And this is the book that I wrote. It's called The Fibromyalgia TMJ Connection, How Your Jaw, Your Teeth, Your Airway and Meridians Affect Your Symptoms. So really this book is written so the fibromyalgia patient can actually go through this book and they can answer all the questionnaires the mm-hmm. TMJ questionnaire, the airway questionnaire, and the meridian. And then they know whether or not there's they need to see um, a TMJ dentist. They can decide themselves because if they fit into that, I have to tell you, people are reading it and they're going, oh my God, I have all of these symptoms. So then they know to go see a TMJ dentist. You know, they've gone to medical doctors. There's no blood work. Well, in my mind, there's no blood work because if it's a TMJ airway and meridian problem, you may not have any blood work that's going to show fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. So um, my book came out in August and... um, Of 2023? Yes. Um, Okay. Okay, Just came out. And during the time that I was researching my book, I went to all sorts of dental conferences. I went to um, TMJ conferences. I went to I, I went to Dr. Liao's airway conference, and and I have to tell you, he's he's got it right on that that dentist. He yeah. um, he knows how how the jaw and everything affects the rest of the body. I learned so much from him, and. Um, so they're expanding the palates. They're they're looking at cephalometrics. So they're looking at the measurement of the inside of the jaw. And I will tell you, I actually, when I interview people, I measure their palate. I measure their palate with this. It mm-hmm. should fit across their molars. If it doesn't, they're narrow. And I will tell you, of all the people I've interviewed, the bipolar people are the narrowest of all of the people I've interviewed. Mm-hmm. And is that I it, that may not be cause and effect. I'm, it needs more research. But what I'm saying is those people are not sleeping hardly at all. Yep. And the same with ADHD kids. If they got narrow, I've been interviewing ADHD kids. If they have where you can only see the four teeth of their smile, they've got a high palate. They don't sleep well. And there's a doctor, Ben Marigalis, and he's he did a YouTube video and he says that really ADHD is sleep deprivation. So of the people I've sent to Dr. Rondo's, once they get their palate expanded, their entire behavior changes. They can sleep better and they're better. So that's another avenue that now I'm going out and speaking. I, I want to speak to parents and groups to to see if I can get that information out there. Oh, absolutely. And I'm going to, I'm going to kind of validate a lot of things that you've said, because this is the stuff that we've been uh, able to tease out from our data set here in Texas uh, since about 2018. We looked at people with fibromyalgia, we looked at um, other uh, correlative diagnosis codes. Okay. And we actually did this for, for, uh, for a data set we're trying to publish. And we did find TMJ is probably in pretty much everyone. Um, sleep apnea and over 95%. Uh, we also found um, an interesting correlation with uh, peripheral neuropathy, specifically uh, C fiber neuropathy. And we found correlations with um, with uh, a lot of clicking uh, in the jaw. Not So instead of people having just TMJ pain, they may not have pain, but they actually have clicking like when they open as well. 
Right. And so this kind of sent us down this path of what's going on. But uh, let's back up a little bit. You talked about there's no labs or there's no signs of fibromyalgia. There is. And uh, this is what uh, this is one of the, the great new things about science, right? Looking at disease correlations. So for the doctors who are out there listening to this and for the patients, I guess, um, one of the things that's always chronically elevated in people with fibromyalgia is a very nonspecific marker called high sensitivity CRP, HSCRP. Um, that's, that's not commonly checked by your doctor. So something you can request if you want to. Um, another thing is that whenever you take your blood pressure, when the doctor takes your blood pressure, you have what's called diastolic hypertension which means that the bottom number of your blood pressure looks higher relatively to your top number. And this is not something that you wouldn't know about unless um, unless you understand what the physiology of the body is. So ask your doctor if, you, if the bottom number seems high. And the reason is the di- diastolic number is when your heart starts relaxing. relaxing. Mm-hmm. So our heart starts relaxing. Well, what happens with fibromyalgia? If you have malocclusion, all your fascia is tight right here. Your intercostal area is tight. Your, your diaphragm doesn't necessarily fully deploy. It doesn't go all the way down. It's hard during diastole because there's a lot of pressure around the left ventricle, around the heart. That's right there. So diastolic hypertension is actually one of the biomarkers that we look for. Oh, and then yeah. we start asking about TMJ issues, the stop bang questionnaire for sleep apnea and the airport sleep scale and all these different things that we, are, we start using, right? And we're able to identify this. But I also want to talk about how everything that you just said, how it relates to the whole body, even the bottom of the foot. Okay. And so a lot of people with fibro tend to have a lot of tension, numbness, tingling, extremities, feet, temperature changes. And it's because the when the fascia is tight up here, the fascia is tight all the way down to the feet. Okay. Right. And so there's a new concept in peripheral neuropathy called constrictive neuropathy, meaning that the small nerve fibers in the hands and feet, what we used to think is that, oh, there's something wrong. They just don't fire (laughs) as readily, right? But the new philosophy is that the fascia around it is constricting it so much, you're cutting off nutrients and blood supply and lymphatic flow. You're increasing the tension in that muscle bundle, okay? Okay. And it's placing pressure on the areas and the C fibers aren't necessarily able to work because there's so much compression around there. So there's a lot of fascia release techniques with fascia balls like this one that I have right here that I use all the time to roll on the feet and the TMJ and all these different areas. And they actually have significant symptomatic improvements. So we started monitoring these people with peripheral neuropathy and fibromyalgia. Well, after a while, their C fiber conductions that we do in the in the in the in the office, they they start normalizing like quick too. And I'm like, what is going on? This I didn't think this was reversible, but once again, we're, we're seeing that it can be. Now, if, if you're an acupuncturist or if you're a chiropractor listening to this, you're like, duh, <laughs> because that's sort of the foundation of uh, of that type of medicine. But from a Western medicine philosophy, this is something that's that's really relatively new. So compressive C fiber neuropathy and compressive peripheral neuropathy is the mechanism in which this uh, actually occurs. And another big sign um, when people come in to the office is I look at their smile, <laughs> right. right? Look at their teeth, their smile. I'm starting to notice these things. I'm not trained to do that. I'm not a dentist, but when they do that, and I'm looking at their nasolabial folds. Are they symmetrical, Right. And then a lot of times when I walk into the office, they, they turn around and like, hey, Dr. Ron, like they're not turning their neck, <laughs> you know? I'm like, hey, is your neck okay? I like, I think so. It's like, probably because you're used to it. So these are all a lot of the signs that I right. look at, you know, from, 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 uh, from my standpoint. But I think that once we honor how the fascia and the body and the strictures and the airway and the TMJ kind of correlates with everything, um, there's, there's nothing mystical about, about fibromyalgia anymore. It's a very physical and real symptom. That's okay. That's right bipolar disorder. So uh, so I do a lot of brain mapping in my office. So we the people who have bipolar disorder, uh, the, their brain map looks like it's in always in what's called a hypervigilant state. Um, and then it will transition into like really fatigued state. All right. And they'll go right back. Right. So that hypervigilant state, fatigue state going right back, that's technically sleep deprivation. Okay. And so the people with bipolar disorder tend to have sleep deprivation for a long time. There's a huge association of bipolar disorder and sleep apnea and upper airway resistance and, and airway syndromes, right? ADHD. So um, for those of you who uh, have access to YouTube, 
go on YouTube and type in the skull brain connection. That's my, that's my video I did with Dr. Gerald Simmons, a sleep neurologist here in Houston. Right. And we talk about how ADHD and bipolar and, uh, and anxiety disorder, a majority of that is sleep apnea. He says that ADHD is sleep apnea uh, uh, until proven otherwise. Well, it may not be full blown sleep apnea, but people at least are having some sleep disorders due to uh, restricted airway syndrome. So, and so that's happening more and more in, uh, in kids now. And part of the reason, I, and I learned from Dr. Felix Liao, is because these kids are being introduced to solid foods much later on, you know? And he said they should be introduced between four to five months. I'm like, I didn't do that for any of my daughters. <laughs> I did it much later right. in fearing that there's a choking hazard, right? And so there's this conundrum that's happening right now, and there's not enough time for the palate to develop wider, whereas before, a couple hundred years before, where skulls look really different uh, than and now, solid foods are introduced much, much earlier out of necessity and it allow the pressure for the palate to, to widen, the epigenetic stretch, we call it, uh, to, to actually widen up. And it allows the cranial and the skull sutures to, to widen up, right? And so this is why so many people have deviated septums these days is because the, the septum is connected to the palate uh, that's right here. If it never fully forms and the septum grows, the septum can only grow like one crooked direction instead of being straight also. So there's a huge association with chronic sinusitis, sinus disease, histamine intolerance and stuff like that. And so I think, in, in, you know, your story is actually such a such a common one, but no one really wants to to speak out about it. And I do believe a lot of people with chronic pain have been kind of conditioned not to say too much uh, because there's not necessarily a validation from the general medical community. And we're really trying to change that. So now the, the fascia, the Reynolds, Reynolds disease, that's, yeah, Reynolds, kind of, that's, Reynolds, yeah. that's from the fascia restriction too, is it? Yeah. So what happens is Reynolds is when uh, there's lack of uh, blood flow to certain parts of the body, usually the parts that's the farthest away from the heart, so the fingers and the toes, and the fingers starts uh, um, turning colors. So it's thought to be an autoimmune process, quote unquote, and maybe part of it is. But in reality, what's happening is that the body is sequestering that area to shut off to redirect the blood flow like back to the heart. So this is why when some people are um, in cold places and cold situations, they have Reno, it's, it's, it's constricting up. But some people, they, they have that even without being cold. But it may be because the, the night before, they were grinding so much at nighttime, right? Because the malocclusion and all the fascia is constricted like superiorly in this direction. Your head's tilted forward, your chin is back, right? Your shoulders towards your ears, you know? That constriction over time, it actually does create this Reynolds uh, effect in a lot of people as well. And so, but, but that's what, the, that's what that is. Yeah. I will tell you, I had a man that I interviewed and his head was forward. He was hitting the same tooth I was, but I put wax, you know, the dental wax, I put it between his upper and lower teeth yeah. and opened up his, that opened up his airway. His, his whole head went back and his ears were then in the middle of his shoulders. It was just, he's holding his head to open up his airway and as soon as i opened it up with the wax his head went back to a normal position wow it's fascinating yes and and this is where why we have to get oral health specialists ents orthodontists airway dentist airway or, dentist, airway dentist. <laughs> yeah to to really understand this and, and dr felix calls it airway of mouth doctors right That's it should right. be airway mouth doctors and rather than the term dentists and it's because uh there's there's a, there's not only a correlation with just fibromyalgia, but other disease states like mental health disease states, uh, Alzheimer's disease, right, and different uh, Tourette's and syndrome. That's a big one with airway disorders. Mm -hmm. Well, Doctor Doctor um, Garcia and Doctor Liao, they both help kids with Tourette's. So, I mean, I think that's amazing. The other thing I wanted to mention, I. Um, there was a lady that lived down the road from me and she was coming out with the wrong word when she spoke. So the doctor took her license away. And I said, well, do you sleep well? And she says, oh, no, no, I'm up half the night. And she had dentures. So I told her, I want you to leave your dentures in at night for a week. And she did. She slept till eight o'clock. She now had no problems finding her words. I wrote a letter to her doctor to see if he would do a sleep study with her dentures in and her dentures out. 
And he said, no, so she didn't get her license back. But I think I think they really need to reassess, should dentures come out? It, to me, it, they're trading gum health for their airway. And yeah. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, and, and we actually just recently talked about this with Dr. David Alfie. He's an oral maxillary facial surgeon. So he's a dentist and an MD. So he's DDS MD. And he does these surgeries um, that are basically jaw surgeries. And, and he'll tell you the same thing. Like sometimes when you don't have dentures in, you you bite down, your entire airway just collapses and backward. Right. Right? So unless you're testing for people in that in that time, like it's it's invisible, you know, which is really concerning. Right. Right? Um, and the other thing, and I'll, I'll tell you probably about that doctors is not, sometimes it's not the doctors won't do it. It's sometimes they know the insurance is going to deny it <laughs> doing, doing, uh, do a dual sleep studies. And, uh, unfortunately I think, uh, that has to catch up. I think airway health has to be put into the bucket of medical insurance, uh, eventually right now is in like dental and dental insurance, which should be in medical insurance. It's starting to go that direction sometimes in some certain situations, but it should be a universal thing. Um, especially, you know, the older we get, the more we live with chronic pain and and, and TMJ issues, uh, the worse it actually gets as well. So, um, so I'm just going to wrap up uh, here. Our time is, uh, is about up. Um, we covered a lot today and I'm glad we did because I think this, not, this, not only does this really need to get out to the medical community and the dental community, it needs to get out to, to everyone. And I think that for people who are living with pain, uh, you don't have to be necessarily reliant on medicine all the time. You just have to continue uh, that path forward. Um, but I also want to ask you uh, one thing as we end. Um, throughout all this, I mean, I would imagine that it's got to be physically and emotionally taxing trying to explain this to people and getting people on board on this, right? Um, what's your experience uh, in, in when you try to get this in front of people? And is this idea generally accepted or is this something that, that people kind of blow you off on? Or how's it like? It's extremely acceptive. I do a presentation. I do a, a two-hour presentation. I've got a slide presentation. And I also show Dr. Gerald Simons, the one you talked about. Yeah. I show his video. It's the one on uh, the misfit mouth. Oh and yeah. I also show the one on the ADD, the sleep deprivation, and I also show a video on the Tourette's. Dr. Garcia's got with the splint in and the splint out. He got his Tourette's back. So I show that and I do a lot of um I do the questionnaires. I let them do the questionnaire as I do the presentation, and I have to tell you these people can hardly wait to get to the TMJ dentist. I right. mean they're That's so crazy. excited. They are so excited. I spend a lot of my time doing this and I do all my assessments for free. Um, I want them to spend the money on their dentists. Um, and I want to find a way of getting getting the money for the people that can't afford to to get the splints that they need. Um, I, you know, we have um, our healthcare system is different. And because of that, I would like to approach the our um, Minister of Health. Um, I want and them. You're in Canada, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. And I uh -huh. want to approach the Minister of Health and I want there to be some help for people. There has to be somebody in government that's got fibromyalgia. And when they see this, I personally, I think they'll buy into it. Right. But, I well, you know, in uh, I don't think even from my point, I don't think there's anything to buy because there's no other great alternatives right now other than some medications, stimulators, and stuff like that for symptomatic uh, management. But for there to be hope to put fibromyalgia into a remission process, and knowing that it's possible for some people, that's that's where the pursuit really lies, and I think that's uh, that's really beautiful. So amazing. So uh, can you hold up your book once again so people can see? See, and this is on Amazon, by the way. So it's the fibromyalgia yes. TMJ connection. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, look for the fibromyalgia TMJ connection on Amazon. Get a copy of the book. And then how do people find more about you and try to support you and what you do? Well, I've on the book, I've got my email address. I've got a phone number. Um, I actually uh, just did a video for YouTube. 
I've got a blog. The blog is written on the back of the book. Um, it's interesting, a hygienist that's, that read my book, she said, oh my heavens, this is an aha moment. She said, this is absolutely amazing. And she's now using it to try to help people in her office. No, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank you for being on with me today. It's a fabulous story. And I love that you're sharing your story. And I hope people will listen to this and get inspired. And if you're a healthcare professional listening to this, please get inspired because a lot of the patients in this population um, are relatively silent about it. They're a bit ashamed about it. And a lot of times they're they're taught that their symptoms may be either made up or doesn't necessarily exist. And that's not that's not necessarily true. And Linda, you were, you were the head of a head nurse of a hospital and me being uh, an MD and the things that we do and looking at large data set and analytics and chronic pain, there's a big connection here that's been missing in medicine. So thank you so much for being on. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. No problem.